Hallo liebe Motorsportfreunde, wir begrüßen Sie zu einer weiteren Folge unserer Interviews aus der Welt der Formel 1 und heute, ich glaube Sie sehen es am Auto und an den Trophäen, wir sind heute bei Mercedes, dem Team, das achtmal in Folge die Konstrukteursweltmeisterschaft gewonnen hat. Letztes Jahr ging es nicht ganz so gut, die Saison ist, hat mit Problemen begonnen, aber Mercedes hat die Kurve gekriegt und zum Schluss konnten sie einen Sieg feiern und der Mann, der das geschafft hat, der steht heute bei uns, George Russell, er hat in den Grand Prix von Brasilien gewonnen, hat Mercedes dann doch noch ein gutes Finale gegeben und ich glaube, wir können sagen, er ist ein Weltmeister von morgen. Hello George, thank you very much that you take the time to talk to us thank about you. last season and maybe what's about to come now. Thank you. Uh, we see here all these trophies. Where's yours from Brazil? My one's in reception, okay. so the other side. I saw it this morning when I came in, so uh, yeah, good memories. Yeah, that's, I guess, the original. Do you have a replica? I should be getting the original, so <laughs> <laughs> when I walked past, I thought maybe I'm going to take this now, but yeah. uh, the team lets me keep the, the original. But I wanted to keep the trophy here for some time because oh, okay. for the team, you know, it was, it was such a big moment for, yeah. for everybody after the difficult year, so to have that small bit of success um, I think it's a good boost over over the winter. Yeah, so you collect all your trophies also for the second and third places then, I guess? They're replicas. Yeah, they're at home. Yes. They're the yeah. Place at home. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, good, yeah. yeah. We see here the car, I think it's a 2020 car. If you could pick one of these Mercedes of the newer era, which one would you take? Well, I think, well, firstly, this car has my name on the back okay. because this yeah, is yeah. The, I saw it already. The, <laughs> the car I drove in uh, Sakir in, in 2020. I mean, I think this was probably the best mm. Mercedes car they ever built. I mean, driving this was just such a joy, especially coming from Williams, which we were at the back. We scored no points in that season. Driving this, it was like driving a PlayStation. It just mm -hmm. felt so nice to drive. You felt so confident. And I knew it, after five laps, I could push this car mm -hmm. to the limit. And I wasn't afraid of anything. Whereas when you're driving, you know, Williams or a car at the back of a grid, the cars move in, you don't have the confidence to push. The brakes are a little bit more difficult. So this was, yeah, this was probably the, the peak Mercedes from the last eight years. Okay, and are you keen in, in collecting your racing cars? I mean, I would love to collect my race cars. It's um, obviously not quite so simple to have a race car okay. in your living room. Maybe I need to talk with Toto to uh, you know, get that into, uh, into my deal. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the hot stuff now and have a seat. Let's do it. Yeah, George, uh, the first Grand Prix is only four weeks away. How was your winter? Was it any different to other winters before? Not really, no, to be honest. Um, just making sure I made the most of my time at home with my friends, with my family, and sort of recharging because I learned last year how intense this season is from when you start end of February until when you finish the end of November. Mm. Other than the small break we have in the middle, it is absolutely full gas. So. You know, I feel in a really good place uh, mentally. I think um, that's also important. Everybody talks about you know, being physically in the right place, which I also feel in a good place, but I think mentally is probably the best I've felt for, uh, for a long time. But you had already some driving, I've heard. Yeah, already some driving. I did uh, one uh, Pirelli test in Paul Ricard. Mm. So after nine weeks out of the car, that was a shock to the yeah. system <laughs> to drive again, I think. You know, these Formula One cars are so, so fast. Um, the forces on the body, you mm. know, my, my legs are sore, my back, my neck is very, very tired. Um, it's been a, a couple of days ago and I'm still sore in my mm. arms. So, you know, it takes time to get back into race fitness. And you told me before, it's very interesting, it was the fastest Paul Ricard ever. Mm, yeah, it Why was, was that? Well, it was, yeah, it was well over two seconds quicker than the race weekend. And it was because it was so cold. Mm. So the tyres were not overheating. At the race weekend, I think it was 50 degrees track temperature. In um, the test, it was around 10 degrees. Uh, the air temperature was about 8 degrees. And in the race, I think it was 35. Mm. So you have more air density, which means more downforce. So it just felt like we were running high downforce anyway, but it felt like another level of downforce. So that was a, a fun experience. Yeah. I mean, you came from a team at the bottom of the field to a top team. And when we look at the timetable, let's say in Q1, the difference between a top team and the one on the bottom is two, two and a half seconds. When you, you know both team sizes now, where are these two seconds? What, what is different in a top team to, to one at the bottom? There's not one 
mm. individual thing that is the reason it's um i think the organization and the structure from the very top has a big impact on how the workforce operates um you know these cars are so complex it's like one big puzzle and you need to make the perfect pieces but the pieces also need to come come together and i think that's where the communication skills between all of the you know the aero department the uh, the simulator the vehicle dynamics uh, the tire group the engine it all needs to come together to uh, to work in perfect harmony but you know mercedes operates at such a high level especially with toto's leadership it's um it's an impressive outfit and it's why i have confidence that even after a difficult year mm. this team will will get back to the, to the top step I think you came pretty well prepared to Mercedes. It was not a completely new team to you. No. But after one year, has there been any surprises in the day to the, which you found out in the day-to-day -day business? Um, nothing substantial in terms of surprises, but constantly impressed at how, um, how high the level of engineering is here. It's, it's really quite spectacular. And, um, you know, the the people in the whole factory that operate at such a high level. That's been something that has taken some time for me to get used to because we're talking about things I've never spoken about before or even seen before. And that's been an educational uh, journey for me to try and improve the car, to learn how I can get more from the tools at my disposal. Um, but no, it's a, it's a very impressive team. And, um, but I, I feel like I'm at home. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I've got such a good relationship with everybody and excited for this second year together. If somebody has told you before last season that you will win your first Grand Prix, you will win a sprint, you will have a pole position, I think you had been eight times on the podium, 275 points, would you have taken it or are you, because it's Mercedes, in a way disappointed that it was not more? I think if you offered me this yeah. before the season, I would have said no thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because my goals and aspirations are much greater and the goals and aspirations of this team are mm. much greater than what we achieved last year. You know, I believe in Mercedes, I believe in myself. And if you want to win a world championship, you need to be winning 10 or more races per season. Um, but I'm not disappointed with the year we had. You know, we had the car, we did. And you have to make the most of the, the tool that you have. And I think... I think we did a very good job um, to maximize the points. You know, we were very close to second in both championships, mm -hmm. maybe with one or two slightly different results around maybe Silverstone or Singapore. You know, we could have finished P2 in the Drivers' Championship, which, considering we had a car over one second off the pace at, at times, would have been pretty impressive. But, you know, I'm still pleased with the performance mm -hmm. we, we showed. Uh, in hindsight, was it maybe even better to have, at the beginning of this Mercedes period for you to have a more difficult year that the focus was more on will they fix the problems of the car then you know otherwise it would have been Lewis against you and everybody would have focused on that. I mean you have to um, take a positive from every situation. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say this was the year I wanted. I will sit here now saying it has grown me as a person as a driver for sure mm -hmm. but equally if I was fighting for the world championship it would have also grown me as a person, as a driver. So, um, you know, I sit here now, you know, pleased with how things panned out, thinking it's going to have made me a better driver. But equally, if the car was one second faster or one second slower again, it would have been a similar, a similar view. So um, I'm ready to fight now. I'm ready to, to chase that, that championship. Let's come to this car. Uh, Lewis said, with all his experience, he more or less felt in the from the first lap onwards, something is wrong with it. How long did it take for you? Because you were used to cars which were mm. probably even much worse than the one you drove last year. Well, I knew uh, straight away it wasn't to the level that Mercedes mm. are usually capable of, capable of, but equally I knew it was a big regulation change. And at the end of the day, it's a relative game for everybody. Even Red Bull's car this, year, this season is maybe, I don't know, two seconds slower yep. than the year before. Mm -hmm. So that Red Bull car is not quick in terms of pure pace, but it was very, very quick. 
compared to everybody else. Mm. So um, these current generations of cars, they're not the quickest Formula One cars we've ever seen, but we're not fighting or racing against history. We're mm. racing against our competitors in yeah. the, same, the same time as us. So I, um, I didn't read too much into it at the beginning because I wanted to wait to see what Ferrari and Red Bull have done. But then obviously when you come back and you see the lap times mm. and they're one second in front, you know something's not quite right. But is lap time the only, how shall I say, factor which you can compare or are there some symptoms in the car where you say that is generally, generally wrong? It's lap time is a huge uh, factor because um, it's, it's quite psychological as well because when we raced in Brazil and when mm. we won in Brazil, the car wasn't substantially better than it was two or three weeks before in Austin or in Singapore when we weren't fighting for victory. Mm -hmm. But when, you're, when the car doesn't feel quite right, but you're at the top of a timesheet, psychologically you think, okay, I know there's something to improve, but something must be right mm -hmm. because we're fast. Yeah. But if the car is not feeling quite right and you're down the timesheet, you know this is definitely not right. Yeah. So your, your mind plays tricks with you because at the end of the day, the lap time and the, the number of points you have is the only thing that matters. Yeah. Louis said it was the most unpredictable car if he's ever driven. He called it, I think, a rattlesnake at one stage. <laughs> How was it for you? Was it also unpredictable? Yeah, it was um, yeah, very, very tricky to drive. Mm. Obviously, after three years at Williams, that was also not an easy car to drive. So the transition for me was, was perhaps quite similar. And actually, in terms of pure performance, the pace of the, the Williams I drove the years before was probably similar mm -hmm. to what I experienced um, last year with, with Mercedes. But, you know, we, we, we knew when the car was, was feeling better or when the condition suited us a little bit more. And the car was totally transformed. But on other times, it was, it was not pleasant to drive. And also with the paupers in, it was just an uncomfortable beast sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain, I mean, what happens in the cockpit when the car starts porpoising or, or bouncing, or however you want to call it? Yeah, I think the worst time I experienced was in, in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. When we're porpoising down the straight, we're doing 3.30 into turn one. And my vision started to become impaired and everything was just a little bit blurry. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't pick my braking points very good. Normally you're looking at the marker boards, 150, 100, to choose where to brake. But everything was just a little bit blurry and you know, the car is just smashing on the ground and your whole body has been uh, thrown about. It was, um, yeah, it was a real challenge and that was also when you hit the brakes, the car was still bouncing, so mm -hmm. the tires were sliding. It was um, just not what you're, you're used to in a, in a Formula One car. But even if you, if you sort out the, the bouncing problem or porpoising problem, these car will, the cars will always be very stiff mm. because that's in the nature of these ground effect cars. Yeah. What does it do physically to the driver compared to the cars before? Yeah, I mean, it's not, um, it's not as pleasant to drive and it's definitely more fatiguing. Mm. If you're on a perfectly calm, more of a comfort drive on, on, the, on the highway, let's say, compared to a car that's super stiff, you, you feel every single bump. And that's the same for us. I think in, in Monaco, we really felt how, how stiff the car was and you felt every single bump. Uh, the car was reacting very differently compared to the previous year's mm. car where you would hit a curb or a bump and it would ride over it quite nice. Now you sort of ricochet yeah. off these bumps. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's a challenge. It's something we need to work, work around, but it's the same for everybody. Mm. Uh Unpredictable cars obviously comes also with a lack of confidence sometimes from the driver. How much lap time is lack of confidence in the cockpit? Yeah, I think sometimes it's something we talk about a lot. It could be one tenth, it could be one second, mm. depending on the severity um, of how bad the car is, but also depending on the circuit. If you're in a circuit, for example, uh, as Paul Ricard, lots of runoff, if you go wide or you spin, you won't be in the wall. If the car's difficult, you have a bit more confidence to push. Mm -hmm. But if you're in Monaco or Singapore and the car is difficult, you, you might lose two seconds because yep. you can't attack the corners and you know one small mistake, you're in the wall and game over. 
So there's so many different factors uh, at play. Yeah. I mean, the season was a little bit back and forth. Mm. There were moments we all thought, and probably you also thought, oh, that's the breakthrough, and then it was a setback. And then again, breakthrough, yeah. setback. How difficult was that to handle? Yeah, that was, that was definitely quite challenging uh, psychologically for, for the whole team because we felt like we were taking a step forward, that we understood some things, and then we got kicked back down to, to earth. And um, it was only maybe around Zandvoort time mm -hmm that we truly understood why we were having such a yo-yo in performance. I think that was very important for our understanding and important for, for next year. So um, I think and it's, it's an experience of, of life as well. You need to, to go through these challenges, you need to learn. Mm. And there's no shortcut to finding um, more performance or more success. You need to learn, you need to live, you need to experience, and then you can and build from there. How important is it for you as a driver to understand real the, really the background, why something like this happens? Or are you just saying, okay, fix it, and once it's fixed, I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, we don't need to be an engineer, mm. is, is the fact, because we're a racing driver. Our job is to drive the car fast, but to give the feedback. Mm. And this is when we work quite a lot with the engineers. I would drive a corner, and I said, the car is reacting like this at this specific point and I would show you exactly in the data where it is and then they would start to analyze um, why that was the problem, we'd make some changes and then I can feed back again if we've improved or not but as I said I don't need to be um, the technical engineer yeah. to resolve these problems. My job is to drive fast, be consistent and give the good feedback and try and point slightly in which direction uh, we need to take if this is better. It might feel better, but is it faster? Mm. And, that's, and that's what it comes back to, uh, lap time again. Okay, and then we came to Brazil and everything worked there. Mm. Uh, do you have an explanation? Why just there? Why just this one race? Because you won square and fair, you have to say. Yeah. There was no gift, were no gifts from others. Yeah, I think we, I mean, we brought some upgrades to Austin. Um, the car was slowly improving throughout the whole season. And I think from Austin until the end of the season, the only two circuits that suited our car was uh, Brazil and Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe we could have won in Mexico. I think I made a poor start, but I think if we... Tire were, choice was maybe not the best. Tire <laughs> choice was not, was, not, yeah. was not correct. And I yeah. think if we made the right tire choice, mm -hmm. started on the medium and go into soft, I think we could have won this race. So. Um, yeah, Mexico and, and Brazil suited our car. High downforce was suiting our car better. And they're not very, um, they're not circuits that have a lot of long straights. There's a lot of, a lot of corners. Obviously, Mexico has a long straight, but there's another change here that with the, the high altitude, there's less mm -hmm. drag. We were losing a lot of speed in the straight because of uh, the drag of the car compared to Red Bull. And in Brazil and Mexico with the, with the altitude, that affected us less. So we basically gained mm. maybe three temps just because of the, the atmosphere and the, the conditions. So that was also a factor. In Brazil, you had this great fight with, uh, with uh, Max in the, in, in the sprint for five or six laps back and forth and really close racing. Would that fight have been possible with the old cars? Over such a length? Yeah, um, it's difficult because for sure the following has, it, has been improved mm. a lot this year with the new cars. But equally, the slipstream has been less. So you need to have that slipstream to catch in the straight to, to fight. Um, honestly, I, I couldn't give you yeah. an answer on this. <laughs> okay. Um, you drove with probably you have the you had the teammate or you have the teammate which is probably the most difficult to beat. Lewis won seven world championships. Uh, normally, when you look back in history, when a young lion comes in with with a superstar into one team, that is asking sometimes for trouble. But it was very quiet. It, uh, why was that? Well, I think um, probably going back to the management of of Toto, I think he was very clear from the beginning what he expected from one another. But also, I think Lewis and I have a good relationship. I think when you've maybe looked in the past, um, 
maybe there's been a slightly closer age gap between mm -hmm. the two and there's been uh, people fighting for let's say that top spot within the team but with Lewis and I you know there's no top spot you mm -hmm. know we're both on an equal playing field and you know Lewis is on the latter phase of his career I'm at the, the start of my career so we're just at very different points he's had all of the success he has nothing more to prove and I'm you know I'm obviously young I'm here just to to try and win races and I think um, you know we're helping trying to help one another we're on this journey improving the car trying to get Mercedes back to the top so yeah it's, it's just a very different dynamic to um, let's say Lewis and Fernando in the past mm. or um, I don't know Sebastian and Mark or yep. I can't think of other mm. Ale, uh, Prost and Senna, Senna yeah, you yeah. Know, two people similar mm. age battling together so um, yeah hopefully it continues. Mm. Will it also continue when you're fighting for the championship? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see no reason why not. Yeah. It's obviously going to be a very different dynamic mm. um, if we're fighting one, two for every every race weekend. But I think we're both mature enough and experienced enough to to know what the team needs and the team needs harmony. It needs mm -hmm. a good relationship um, to be able to push us forward. And if we break down our relationship, it won't benefit the team and it's going to compromise us over time and mm. maybe we don't have the car to actually fight for victory. So yeah. we know the importance of this. How different are you in driving? Are there any things he does completely different to you or you different to him? Yeah, I think, yeah, there's a, a few little uh, differences, um, nothing too substantial. I think Lewis has always been very strong in braking. Mm -hmm. I think he's always been very late on the brakes, pushing uh, the entries quite a lot. Um, which has been quite quite impressive for me to, to see. But I think the interesting thing with, with racing, I think any sport, there's no right or wrong way. You know, if you look at Messi and Ronaldo in, in yeah. football, two totally different players, but two of the greats, or, you know, Rafa, Roger and uh, Djokovic, mm. you know, they have three totally different playing styles, but they're all three greats. So I think it's important not to try and copy one great you need to um, you know get the most out of yourself and do what is right mm. for you when you try to figure out what the other one is doing do you learn more from the data or from driving behind another driver and seeing what they actually is doing on track it, to be honest is always from from the data mm. because the difference is maybe you're going at 330 into into a corner and you're breaking three meters later yeah. I mean three meters at 330 kilometers mm. an hour is Nothing, you know, yeah. I don't know what it would be in, mm. in time, but less than one tenth of a second for sure, you know, maybe one millisecond. Um, it's details, every Formula One driver is, is driving at a super high level, and then it comes down to these, these fine details how the driver's braking, going on the gas, how they're turning into the corner. So, I think data and watching the onboard video is the two most powerful tools, yeah. Uh, was it important for you that you were beating him on points last year? Um, I mean, of course, I want to beat my teammate. Mm. You know, that will, uh, that will always be the way for every single F1 driver. And um, that will continue to be the way I want to beat him and he mm. wants to beat me. But for me, that victory was more important than the point standings. Um, but at the end of the day, nobody remembers who finishes second. Yeah. And we finished fourth, yeah. so nobody, you know, <laughs> next year we yeah. won't even rem we won't remember. Yeah. And uh, if we if we win the first race mm. of the season, yeah, last year will be a thing of the past. But the strange thing is, he won the qualifying battle, I think, thirteen to nine, yeah. and you won on points. You would think, well, if you know, if he makes the difference, it's rather in the race with all his experience. How do yeah. you explain that? Yeah, I think, I think we had, I can think of five races where we were split in qualifying by less than half a tenth. Mm -hmm. And I think on every occasion except one, he was ahead. And, you know, half a tenth is, is nothing. So, it, you know, these races could have easily have just gone the other way. I can think Abu Dhabi, I can think Mexico, Austin, Melbourne. Um, and there was one other race where it was very, very close. And this, and this happened on many occasions with, with him and I. But mm -hmm. when it was less than half a tenth, it was always, he was just ahead. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise it was, I was two temps ahead yeah. or he was two temps ahead of me. 
Um, but I think maybe for me, I've always, qualifying's been my strength, mm -hmm. for sure. But this year I put a lot of focus on, on the race. I tried focusing on um, what I needed to do as a driver, what I needed to do with the car setup, and I think that probably contributed to, to that difference because mm. there were times that I, I probably compromised my own qualifying performance with the setup to try and benefit me in the race. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine driving is one piece of what you have to do, but I can imagine if you come, if you are in a team like with somebody like Lewis. You want to also find out how is it possible somebody can become seven-time world champion, mm. be successful over such a long time. What did you find out? What makes have these super successful people something in common? I think it's re resilience, to be honest, and constantly striving for more. You know, he he never stops. He always wants to improve. He always wants to do better in everything he does in life. And um, yeah, I guess that's that's pretty uh, admirable and interesting to see how he he goes about his way of life, but I think when you're super competitive, you always you always want to win. And yeah. for me, even you know when I'm at home playing cards with my family, I want to win every time. Yeah. And <laughs> that's, that's never going to change. Yeah. How much are you in this virtual racing business? Because uh, Lando Norris and, and Max, they seem to race all the time. Mm. Yeah, I do, I do quite a lot. Mm. I don't do it as publicly okay. as them. Um, but you I race think, against them in, in these? No, no, no. I mean, the only time I did was in the eSports against Lando. Max mm -hmm. didn't compete when we did the virtual eSports in 2020 mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And I really enjoyed this process. And it's the only time you're all in equal cars. So you, there's no, uh, you can't complain about anything else. And that's why I found that quite an important moment. Because for me, I was in Williams. I had you know, Lando and Alex, who I race against a lot. Mm -hmm in Red Bull and McLaren performing well. So when I had this opportunity in equal cars, I thought, you know what, I want to show the world what I can do. Mm. And that was a good good opportunity for me. Uh, and you know, I gained some confidence from this and um, not that it means anything, but at the time for me, I was, I'd only done one year in Formula One. It was a big thing to, to win all those races in the, the eSports championship at, at that time. Can you do actually anything good, I mean, for the real business? doing the same what you do in the car, at home, obviously on the computer? Yeah, I think you need to be careful because you can sometimes pick up traits mm -hmm. to, to be fast from the simulator, but it doesn't translate to what your car needs on the racetrack. It's, the fundamentals are still the same. You still have to focus, hit your apexes, carry the speed, don't make mistakes. Um, but you've just got to sometimes be, be wary not to maybe do too much. But for sure, when I did this, these championships, like the pressure was there. Mm. You know, you go into qualifying on the eSports and our hearts were beaten. All of the drivers who I spoke with said the same. So in this regard, that was good learning for, for pressure. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you the German question as well. <clears throat> the new reserve driver of the team is Mick Schumacher. What can you learn in what he's doing then for the team from you and from, from Lewis? I th I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to have lunch with him today, oh, so okay. um, I'm looking forward to seeing his views on, on the team and, and what he has to say because I'm sure there's things that we can learn from him, but I think, um, yeah, I think for him, seeing how this team operates, seeing how maybe Lewis and I work together and with the engineers will probably be useful for him, but for me, if I was in mixed shoes, I would be working super hard in the simulator here in Brackley, really trying to integrate yourself well with the team. But the simulator is a really important uh, asset mm -hmm. for us, and we need you know top quality drivers driving as often often as possible. And obviously, Mick is is one of them. So uh, yeah, he needs to be locking himself <laughs> in that room and, and doing the laps. Coming to the end, what can we expect from you and from Lewis this season? <clears throat> I mean, I don't want to sit here and say mm. we're going to be world champions because the truth is we don't know. Mm. We know that we're going to make a car that is going to be faster than last year's car. I'm confident in that, a car that's better to drive, an engine that might be more, more resilient and um, maybe more, more clean overall. I'm sure we're going to improve this compared to last year, no doubt. But... 
what has everybody else done? Yeah. And this, this is the thing, it's, it's a relative game. So I will probably be able to tell you after half a day of testing <laughs> mm -hmm. in Bahrain, if the car is performing as we expect, and when we see the lap times, to see how Red Bull mm -hmm. and Ferrari are expecting. But I would like to think that we, at worst, should start the season as we ended last, mm -hmm. last year. I would like to think that is a worst case scenario. But on the paper, we have a new floor rule and that might hurt some teams more than others. Yep. It might help some teams who had more problems with bouncing, like Mercedes versus uh, Red Bull, who had less uh, bouncing problems. On the other hand, uh, Red Bull has 10% less wind tunnel time. Can that be a factor? Yeah, I think it can definitely be a factor, but the benefit Red Bull has is they started from such a high level and they had the foundations there. And often we're using you know, our wind tunnel time to find answers. Mm -hmm. Is this the direction we need to go or is that the direction we, we need to go? Whereas I think Red Bull, because they were on the right track from the beginning, they're not problem solving. They're just mm -hmm. adding performance. So yeah. even though it sounds like we have a lot more wind tunnel time, because they were on the right tracks from the beginning, I don't think it's going to hurt them as much as it seems on paper, because actually we probably use that extra 10% on trying to solve our problems of which Red Bull had already okay. solved. And finally, do you think the, team, uh, the, the field will be closer this year because people have learned from the first year with this new generation of cars? I mean, I'm, I'd like to think so. It's generally a trend over time that the, the field mm. Becomes closer. I don't think there'll be any substantial changes. Um, I think you'll still probably see the top three teams, and then you have your your tight midfield of McLaren and Alpine, maybe Aston Martin with Fernando there joining uh, the battle. But I think that's our dream is to see more cars joining the fight, and we need situations like we saw in Brazil with Kevin taking pole position. You know, I was super mm -hmm. happy for him, yeah. super happy for Haas. <laughs> You know, it's great for the sport and um, often this is not, this is not possible. Mm. Um, so we need to find a way that over time uh, that, that is possible for, for, for teams, slightly smaller teams compared to the big ones. Okay, thank you very much, thank George, for this inside view. It was really interesting and I hope you will, be, will have a successful season and we all hope that maybe Red Bull, Ferrari and Mercedes drive on eye level <laughs> and we will see fights like in Brazil with you and, and Max Absolutely. this year as well. Thank, thank you very guys. much. Cheers, thank you. Liebe Leser, das war's. Vielen Dank nochmal an George Russell. Ich glaube, es waren tolle Einblicke in die, in die letzte Saison und auch ein Ausblick auf die nächste. Und wir werden uns dann wieder melden mit dem nächsten Interview. Bis dahin, Servus. Wenn Ihnen das Video gefallen hat, dann abonnieren Sie unseren Kanal hier. Wenn Sie nochmal in das Interview mit Christian Horner reinhören wollen, dann hier. Und alle anderen Videos, zum Beispiel das, die Teamduelle 2023, dann hier.